of the honor. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of every last bit of the praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Um, you're definitely going to have to fix me up because I can't hear myself at all. You guys can hear me, huh? Lord have mercy. Oh, there we go. That was fast. I can hear myself now. Praise God. God has been so good to us. We just appreciate the Lord for his salvation first and foremost. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his forgiveness. He's so good to us. I come to you today bearing witness that there is only one God. The God that I serve does not exist in a trinity of persons. He is one God. He is the Jehovah God of the Old Testament manifested in the body of flesh. I wish I had a witness, somebody that knew what I was talking about. And also that it requires more than just a simple prayer to make heaven your home. We understand that a man must be born of the water and of the spirit. He must be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which we understand by the gift of revelation, that name to be Jesus Christ. Man must be filled and baptized to the brim with his spirit. We refer to as the Holy Ghost. Those of you that are baptized in that name and filled with that spirit, would you make some noise unto the Lord? Yes, yes, yes. Our pastoral family is not with us today. They're out of state, the great state of Hawaii. Men where I'm sure they have no overcast like we see today, but the sun and skies, maybe very light clouds. It's probably about 70 degrees out there. We pray for them. God would guide them and direct them back. Safe travels to the house of the Lord. Amen. God has been very good to me and my wife. He has blessed us with one more child, a daughter. <laughs> little, little Rebecca Phoebe was born at 3.38 in the morning on June 2nd. She was 7 pounds and 14 ounces. like Sister Rosemary and the Lord. So what they say, Irish twins. I don't know. Some people would disagree, but I think she looks just like, we had to do a side-by-side, -side, you know, had to do a survey side-by-side -side comparison of their newborn picture, you know. But she's here with us, and they're at the house. She's, uh, you know, doing what newborns do, sleeping a lot. And, uh, we're just joyed and thrilled that, that God would bless us in our upper years, higher years, be like Abraham, right? Well, not that close. But fatherhood is a glorious thing that the Lord would entrust you to something. Thank God, because I didn't know how to be a father before I came to the house of the Lord. Thank God for pastors and ministers and men of God that are showing us because if we had no one to show us, we would just leave. That's why there are so many homes with absent fathers. Because young men grow up and they don't know how to do it. So they think that the response is just leave. But thank God for men in the house of the Lord that are teaching us and showing us how to be fathers. How to be good soldiers. And how to be great men of God for God's honor and glory. I'm not going to be very long with you. I have a, a, a message that I would like to share with you. It's just a deposit of thought. If you would be so gracious as to allow me to treat a little bit, a little bit of teaching and maybe some preaching in there, um, we would be eternally grateful uh, for your attention.
attention today. Those of you that have Bibles, turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 7. And here we'll find a familiar portion of Scripture that I would hope would illuminate your path. As the Scripture says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path would guide you and direct you into God's holiness. Holiness is the intelligence of God. I don't think you hear me. Holiness is the intelligence of God. It's God's mindset. It was first given to the prophets and then handed to the apostles. And that message is designed to give us an understanding of who God is, how to serve him with the help of the Lord today you would leave here with a better understanding of what God wants for you in your life would somebody shout amen as we're here in the book of Judges chapter 7 beginning in verse 1 those of you that got it shout amen then Jerubel who is Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. Ask your neighbor, are you scared? That's okay. You can ask your other neighbor. Ask him, are you scared? Are you scared? Are you fearful? Because if you're scared, you can shake the spot. Amen. Don't be scared. Verse 4, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will prove them there. I will test them. I will try them they, there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that laps of the water with his tongue as a dog laps, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bows down on his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all of the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you. And deliver the Midianites into thine hand. Let all the other people go every man unto his place. For the next couple of moments, I would like to speak to you on the topic, quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. I've also subtitled this, A Few Good Men. God's looking for a few, few good men. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them, quality over quantity. I didn't feel the enthusiasm. Find and make eye contact with somebody on the other side of the room and tell them quality over quantity. God's looking for the best. He's looking for the best. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you the honor, the glory. We're asking you right now, God, speak to us here today. Move me out of the way, God, that your name will be uplifted and glorified. Lord, that your your, your spirit, God, that your word, God, Lord, that your presence, God, would be here in this place, Lord, to give us understanding and to show us and guide us and direct us how to make heaven our home. Lord, when it's all said and done here in this place today, we'll turn around and give you all the praise and all of the honor and all of the credit, God, for everything that you're doing in this place. We love you and we thank you. Everybody that was ready said in Jesus' name. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Somebody clap your hands like you've lost your mind. Give God the praise today for he's worthy. Hallelujah. 
Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Those of you that know me um, well enough to any extent or degree that have known me for more than just a little bit um, will know that I always will buy the best. I will always go with the top of the line of whatever it is that is available, whatever selection there is, I will choose the top tier. I will always choose the highest price one. And the reason for that is because I've learned through experience and over the test of time that um, there are usually categories to choose from. You've heard of it, but there's always good and then better and then best. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've always been the guy that has gone straight to whatever the best is. Whatever the top of the line is, that's the one I'm going to purchase. Now, a lot of you may stray away from that because your mindset is, I don't have the money for that. That one's a little bit more expensive. But I found that if you invest, spend a little bit more up front, that in the long run, you won't have to buy it again in another month or another year or another two years because you made a bigger investment up front and you've gone ahead and went all in in this area. I've seen this thing come to pass in a lot of things. I used to have a little 88 Camry. You remember my little black Camry scooting around in that thing? Well, I probably bought a battery for that car one day. And the reason for that is because when you go to the AutoZone, you can get the, the highest one battery, which is like for another $50, you can get the two-year warranty. So whenever the battery would go to kaput, it would be almost right at the three-year mark. And I would just take it to the AutoZone and give me free. And, and I always, always have gone with the top. Because of that. You can go and you can buy wipers for your car. And you can say, I want to get these little cheap ones, the value craft. That's all I got money for. Or you can go with the Rain X with the beaded the, the gloss on it and the single blade. And you can spend $80, $100, $200 on wiper blades. But let me tell you something. I bought wiper blades for my truck like three years ago and they're still on their way. Some of you will go and you will buy paper towels for your house. You will go and you'll get the 99 cent paper towel roll. And when you get it home and you open it up and you're like, man, that's pretty skinny. You put it on your little paper towel roll and in three days you're out of paper towels. Two days you're completely out of paper towels. Had you had gone with the bounty. Had you had gone with the mega roll. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Praise the Lord. Amen. Some of you brothers have gone to Walmart for work boots. Lord have mercy. And I look at you brothers and I'm like, Lord, why you do that? And you come out of Walmart with these Brahma. You got that Brahma brand. You laugh because you know what I'm talking about. And you know them things is almost plastic on the top. There ain't no leather in there. That's all plastic. And you walk around, you go to work for like two months. The sole is hanging out. I can see your toe hanging out. And there you are. Spend another $60, $70 on work boots. I'm, I'm in your mailbox right now, huh? Praise the Lord. Yeah, I, I made that mistake one time. And then I decided to go ahead and go buy a pair of Red Wings. Yeah, and I spent like $300 on them boots. But let me tell you something. That was like five years ago. I still got them boots because I spent $300 one time instead of spending $60 nine times. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Lord have mercy. Some of you guys buy gifts for your children at Christmas time. And you say, I'm going to go ahead and get a whole lot of little cheap toys. 
and you buy and you got this great big Christmas and your child, your child opened up like 30 presents. And you got all these little plastic toys that you got. Some of them came from the Dollar Tree and some of them came from here and there. That's swap me. Amen. And, and by the beginning of February, you were throwing toys away already. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because you went and got a lot of toys for cheap. Now you're throwing them away. Because they were made cheaply. They weren't tested. They weren't tried. They weren't put to work in a fashion that would last. Oh, I wish I had a witness. But if you were to go out and buy just one good toy or two good toys, man, you still got them toys today. And you pass them toys on to your children. You pass you give them away to people that you want to have good toys. Because you've made an investment up front. And you invested in quality materials. You reap the reward in the long run. How many people know what I'm talking about? It's good, bad, or best. It reflects in everything that you buy. You can either go with the cheap and it won't last you. Or you can make an investment and go best. And it will last you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the thing that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. Lifeline is on that one. Endure hardness. Turn to your neighbor next to you and tell him, endure some hardness. You, 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 you got to go through some things. You, you, you can't be so soft and so delicate. At the first thing that somebody comes and tells you, you say, I hurt my feelings. You got to endure some hardness. And this, why? Because you have to do it as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. If any man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. What does verse 5 say? That means you've got to play according to the, the rules. Amen. The scripture is talking about being a soldier. The scripture is talking about enduring hardness that you're going to go through some things. And every time that I read this portion of scripture, my mind automatically goes to some war movie. I'm always thinking of some war because I've never been to war. How many people have been to war? I don't think there's many people in this room that is a war combat veteran. But the only glimpse that we're going to get of it is looking at these movies like Saving Private Ryan. Watching Platoon. Amen. Watching, what's the other one? Dead Presidents. You see these Vietnam movies. And all I see is these men that are romping through the swamps and through the mud, and they're sleeping on the mud. It's raining. They're enduring some things. And always I think about how is it that do you not get tired? Do you not get weary? Do you not want to sit down and rest? Do you, do, you, do you ever feel like you just want to give up? No. These men, it doesn't matter if they get tired. It doesn't matter if they get wet. It doesn't matter if they get sticky. It doesn't matter that they haven't had a shower in a month. It doesn't matter any of these things. They get up and they continue to walk. And they're walking. And you see these scenes of these men that are walking across the countryside in Vietnam. And they're just walking and their feet are wet. And they're enduring some hardness. They don't have time to say, my feet hurt. They don't have time to say, I want to take a break. They don't have time to say, can we stop for a minute and rest? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I always think of these, of these movies. I also think about that one, 300. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You guys know the one I'm talking about where he jumps out and he kicks the guy in the hole and he says, this is Sparta. The name of the movie is 300. The scripture says that he saved Israel by how many? Where do you think they got the movie from? Every time that you see 
one of these movies, I'm reminded of the scripture and I'm reminded of what it is to be a Christian. How a Christian doesn't have time to be going with his feelings and his emotions, that he has to endure some hardness, that there's going to be some things that are going to come against him, that his first priority cannot be his comfort. Turn to somebody next to you and ask him, are you comfortable? <laughs> because if all that we're looking for is comfort, it's going to be very difficult to please him. That called us to be a good soldier. Ask somebody next to you, are you a soldier? Ask the other person on the other side of you, are you a soldier? The scripture that we read in Judges is giving us a snapshot of what it is. What the mark is of a quality soldier. We're seeing firsthand what it is to be a quality soldier. What is the criteria? What is it that is required to be referred to as a good soldier? Because all of our walk, all of our serving God is likened unto being a soldier. If we're going to walk this walk in spiritual maturity and serve God as, 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 as he would want us to, we would have to assume the mindset of a soldier. We would have to endure some kind of hardness. There would be things that would come our way that would try to get us to try to back off a little bit. Take it easy because that's a lot of work. Turn to your neighbor next to you and ask him, are you scared of work? Are you scared of hardness? Are you scared of, 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 of maybe missing a little bit of rest? One that is a quality soldier. The, those that forget they are soldiers, they put the ease of the body before the work of the Lord. You forget you're a soldier when your first mindset is, let's rest. Let's take a break. Let's take it easy now. No one's saying don't take a break. No one's saying don't rest. But if that is your primary first mindset is to take a break, it is very easy that you might find into the, fall into the category that you forgot that you were a soldier. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Because in being a soldier, you have to understand that the burden that you carry has to be greater than the flesh. The mission has to be greater than your feelings and your emotions. I always tell everybody all the time when I teach, I say, you know what? In order to overcome the flesh, you have to liken it unto setting an alarm clock and waking up in the morning. When you set your alarm clock to get up in the morning and it goes off, when you first hear that beep, that alarming going off, your first thought is, how can I stay asleep longer? How can, I, how can I weasel my way into getting just another 10 minutes? That is the flesh. That is the flesh that's speaking to you. And it's telling you, I desire to be satisfied. My feelings and my comfort desire to be appeased because this is, this is, this is so comfortable right here. This blanket is so warm. I'm so warmies right now. Everybody, everybody does it, but you reach over and you hit the snooze. You grab your cell phone, you flip it over, and you're like, thank God for that little button at the bottom. It says snooze. That's your flesh telling you to do that. Amen? Because, because the comfort of where you're at, the flesh is, is desiring to be appeased. The comfort, the ease of laying there. But on the other hand, you have your spirit. And that spirit is the part of you that says, man, if I don't get up, I'm going to be late. And if I'm late, I'm going to get written up. And if I get written up, I'm going to get fired. And if I get fired, I ain't going to be able to pay my rent. If I get fired, I ain't going to have no money. I ain't going to have no Starbucks. I ain't going to have no food. Man, your spirit starts speaking to you. Amen. Amen. All of a sudden, you have to make a decision. Do I walk in the spirit and fulfill not the lust of the flesh, or do I just go ahead and just lay here? This is the battle that every soldier must deal with. You have to learn how to deal with hardness as a good soldier. Those that forget that they're soldiers think most and first of their physical indulgence and are no use to God to expand the kingdom. Oh, you might have to write that down. 
Because God is looking for a quality soldier. Somebody that has that has known, that has understanding that the flesh, that these feelings, these emotions, this, this, this desire for ease and rest is going to be the death of you. Spiritual maturity is nothing more than understanding that you have to walk in the spirit and fulfill not the lust of the flesh. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Somebody knew what I was talking about. I know it's a lot for a Sunday. Can somebody say, get ready? ready. Turn to your other neighbor. Tell him, get ready. ready. In the text... In the text, we see a snapshot of what God considers to be a quality soldier. We're seeing how he takes Gideon and says, listen, by this amount of soldiers, this many that you have, there's no way that I'm going to take you and deliver you from the hand of the Midianites. Because if it's me, if it's me doing it, and, and, and there's so many people, the people are going to say, no, we just outnumbered them, and we did it on our own strength and our own power. God said, no, there's no way because if God's going to do anything, he's going to get the honor and all the glory and all of the praise. God is in the business of performing miracles so much to the point that when he does it, you know he did it. That's why you can turn around and say, he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it. He said, I don't want there to be no mistake, he says. That's why you're going to have to get rid of at least half of them. So the first thing that he did is he tells Gideon, he says, listen, we're going to go ahead and start this process of, of high grading. We're going to find the quality soldiers. We're going to go good, better, best. Turn to your neighbor next to you and tell them good, better, best. We, we, we're going to go ahead and grade them and find out which ones are the best and which ones are just good. We're going to find out which ones are going to be quality high grade, and then we're going to find out which ones are going to be substandard, a little mediocre. He says right off the bat, I want you to go to the people and just tell them flat out, if you're scared, go home. Oh, turn to your neighbor next to you and tell them, are you scared? Because you can't have fearful soldiers out on the battlefield. I mean, come on, all I have is the movies to go off. I ain't never been to battle, but, you know, I've seen the movies where the guy's just sitting there, crouched down, he's got his rifle, and all of the battle is happening, and he's just sitting there with his rifle, and he's just... <laughs> and, and you almost want to slap the guy, right? You're just like, come on, man, you just, yeah, get out of there. Go fight, go get shot or something, man. Rather you get shot than just sit right there. Fear will try to grip you. And this is right here. This is where you see that fear has gripped the soldier. The soldier's worthless. Especially when you see him and he's the one with all the bullets. That brother got all the bullets on him. Just all bullets here, bullets here. And he's just... <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Fear will kill you in serving God. That's why it's so great to understand that God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of... Here, y'all come up here and preach. <laughs> because God didn't input that into your DNA when you were born. You, you got that spirit from somewhere else because the spirit of fear didn't come from God. So fear is the number one thing that the enemy is going to use to come against you to keep you from serving God. There's two kinds of fear. Turn to someone next to you and tell them there's two kinds. You, you, you got to get rid of fear right off the bat. There's two kinds. The first kind of fear is the fear of failure. The fear of failure that if you move forward and you make a mistake, you have fear that you would be corrected. You have fear that somebody would tell you, no, you did this wrong. You have fear that somebody would tell you, no, you messed up in this area. Right away, your first, mis your first thought when you come out is you say, nobody's trained me for this. Nobody taught me how to do this. Nobody showed me this. How am I supposed to do it? Fear tries to come in and get a hold of you. When you begin to move forward and you begin to do it, you, you're afraid of making a mistake. You're afraid of falling. You're afraid of messing up. So the fear of failure is what grips you, it paralyzes you. It keeps you from moving forward. A lot of times, a lot of people think that if I get corrected, 
If somebody tells me, you know what, this is what you should have did instead of this, they take that correction as rejection. Well, if you're telling me that you didn't like what I, that means you don't like me. That means you don't like my work. You don't like what I'm doing. So why am I even here? Correction is not rejection. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them correction is not rejection. <laughs> correction is not rejection. And this fear of the rejection is what grips a lot of young Christians into not wanting to move forward and do the work of the Lord. It's because they feel that if they're not good enough in a certain area and somebody calls them out on it, it must mean that they don't like them, that they don't want them, that they're rejecting them and pushing them away. You're, you're, everything that I did, especially for a young Christian that comes out and does this thing with their whole heart, and they're doing it everything. They're putting everything into it. And all of a sudden, their leader comes to them and says, you did this wrong. It's that fear of rejection. It, 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 it just keeps you paralyzed. It keeps you from moving forward. There's so many people that are here, even in this church, that don't serve God 100% because of the fear of failure. Let me tell you something. God is not concerned about what you're doing yesterday. He's worried about what you're doing today. He's worried about what you're doing going forward. I wish I had a witness. Somebody knew what I was talking about. God, don't, God ain't worried about your mistakes. God's not worried about your shortcomings. God's not worried about your failures. God just says, come on and let's walk. Come on, come on, come on. Not that way. Come this way. A little bit this way. Uh, no, 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 don't go to that side. Come to this side a little bit more. Come this way. Come this little course correction to keep you moving forward on the right path. It doesn't mean that nobody wants you. The fear of failure will grip you. Turn to somebody next to you and ask them, are you fearful? The second kind of fear that you would face is the fear of success. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them the fear of success. Lord, 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 Lord. You, you Right away, you're just like, well, who would be afraid of succeeding? Oh, man, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people that are afraid of succeeding. Success means more responsibility. Success means more leadership. Success means more opportunity, more on your plate, more to deal with. Because bless the name of the Lord, those that are good at Good at work are blessed with more work. Amen. Those that are good at work are blessed with more. Fear of success is what will grip a young Christian because they know that if they do good, they're going to be called to do more. Timothy's wanting to stay Timothy's for two and three years, four years. Lord, hello. Hello. This is a public service announcement. The, the design is that you're not a Timothy for more than one year. Hello. Timothy is leader in training. You get it one year, you move forward. Now you are the leader. But the fear of success will keep you performing this role as a Timothy to the fullest. Keeping your mindset on the vision, keeping your mindset on, on doing exactly what it is that you have to do to be successful because you're afraid of the responsibility. You're afraid of being called. You're afraid of receiving a text that you got to do this. They're asking you to do that. They want you to go here. They want you to go there. They're asking you if you would buy this or buy that or if you would give here or give there because you're so good. And right away, your first mindset is, man, they're just going to keep calling me. They're just going to keep asking me. They're going to keep texting me. Almost to where your phone rings and you're like, ah. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. The fear of success is the fear of responsibility. And responsibility is simply this. Responsibility requires you to give a response. One that responds to the call. One that responds to their responsibility. 
God is looking for somebody that's not afraid. God is looking for somebody that is not fearful. God is looking for somebody that no matter what it is, whether it be success or failure, they're going to keep moving forward. They're going to endure hardness. They're afraid of the hardness. So right off the bat, God separates the fearful because he says, look, at, I don't have time right now to be dealing with everybody's fear. That's deep, huh? Right now, I don't have time to be addressing the fear. If you're there in that area of fear, go ahead and move you to the side. Go home. We'll deal with that later. I want to deal with those already that have no fear. They're ready to move forward. They're ready to endure hardness. Whether it be success or failure, they're moving on in the name of the Lord. I wish I had a witness. Somebody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> then, then he tells Gideon. He says, take the people down to the water for a drink. And you're going to see two types of people there that are going to drink water. Right off the bat, none of these people are fearful. But of the ones that have no fear, they're going to both have two different outlooks. It's really simple, the mark of a good soldier. It's really simple, the mark of a good servant of the Lord. Number one, zero fear. Oh, I wish somebody knew what I was talking about. Number two, he says, bring them down and let's take a look at how they drink water. You're like, take a look at how they drink water. What does that got to do with anything? You got to drink water. Everybody drinks water. So you're telling me that we're going to separate them just by looking at how they drink water? Yes. And in the way that they drink water, it will tell you everything that you want to know just in how they drink water he says if you go down and you take all the people down there to the water they're going to be right there at the little lake at the lakeside and you're going to have two kinds of people you're going to have people that get all the way down and this is the water and they're going to get all the way down and they're going to say You got those people. And then you got some that are going to come to the water. And they're going to go like this. <laughs> Amen. Then you got some that just bury their face in it. Two kinds of way to drink water. You're only going to drink water one way or the other. Amen, somebody. So he says, the ones that come down and bury their face in the water, face down in here like this, they go down here. Get rid of those ones. And you would think to yourself, why? It's very simple. Because I can tell their whole spirit by the way they drink water. I can tell that individual's entire thinking just based off the way that they drink water. I always joke around when, I, when I'm talking to the younger brothers. Not, not joking around. I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious. But it, it sounds funny. But I'm, I'm serious. The brother wants to fellowship, and he says, brother, I want to fellowship with the sister. And then, then, then I said, no, nah, brother, you can't. You're not good enough for that sister. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Everyone's like, oh. <laughs> no, I'm totally joking. And they say, I want to fellowship with the sister. I say, okay, brother, because, you know, the scripture says that he that find a wife find a good thing. So, sister, you should be right there waiting for the man to come find you. You, you should be right there waiting for the brother to come and find you. Nobody liked that. So I need a husband now. It's, the, it's God's will. I tell the brother, I say, look, man, don't go just off of how pretty the sister is. You can't go off of the looks. Looks, looks alone ain't going to do nothing for you. And they're like, what? Because, you know, brothers, you know, right away you're looking for the prettiest sister in the house. I want the pretty sister. Babe. I said, brother, look, check this out. 
go and look inside the sister's car. I tell, I tell, I dare you. I dare you, brother. There's like half of you still don't get it. The other half do. The other half are with me. That's, that's the ones that are walking in the spirit. The other half, you don't get me. That's you in the natural still. Come with us. Come with us to the spirit realm. Here we go. Check it out. All of a sudden after this, everyone's going to get their car detailed. It's so crazy. <laughs> Everybody's going to get their car detailed. I say, brother, go during, during service sometime and just go and just look inside the sister's car. <laughs> if you see McDonald's rappers... If you see Taco Bell, Burger King, if you see Starbucks cups that are all white, you know the white at the bottom with the water? They're all white in the cup holder, and there's like three Starbucks cups, and the other one's got like a little bit of fuzz on it, like from the mold. Uh. And then underneath the seats is like three changes of clothes. There's like two veils, and, and, and you just see like there's all, they got like church shoes and flats, and there's like six pairs of shoes inside the sister's car. I said, that's a snapshot of your future, how your house is going to be. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had to do it. I had, I had to do it. I had to do it. I had to do, I had, okay, now let me show you how this ties in though, let me show you, because the same way that God is telling Gideon, look at how the people drink and that's going to tell you everything there is to know about their spirit, is the same way I'm saying, brother, take a look at the sister's car because that's the same way it's a reflection of her spirit. If she's out of order, disorganized. Amen. How your house might be one day in the future. Amen, somebody. I know a lot of you don't like that. There's about half of you that don't like that. But trust me, trust me, trust me. There's a connection. That will show us how it is that you will be. Because if the same way that the way that they drink the water is showing us how they are. Is the same way that how somebody keeps their car is a reflection of how ordered and how organized and how clean they are. Amen. You come and you look at my car. You know, you should see, you know. If I'm an organized person, if you're an organized person, a clean person, it will reflect in your car. Amen, somebody. Now, now you're lining up with me. Okay, every day I got you. Okay. Check this out. So because he said, look at how they drink water. The brother that gets down and drinks water <laughs> is showing us this brother's spirit. It's showing us what kind of soldier he is. Here's what kind of soldier he is. He's the kind of brother that he doesn't really focus on the task at hand. He's more into taking care of his personal needs. And when he's focused on taking care of his personal needs, indulgences and needs to satisfy his flesh he takes his eye off of the battle in front of him his focus is on bones I come first and because my focus is on taking care of my own needs I leave everything else to one side that's not important to me during this time, while he has his face buried in the water, the enemy could be overtaking him and pounce upon him. 
and it would mean almost certain death for him because his pleasure and his needs came first. I'm preaching to somebody here today. That's a reflection of how his spirit is. He's showing you that even though I'm a soldier, I, I, I'm still I'm still mindful of the cares and the affairs of this life. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the cares and the affairs of this life. That he may please him that has chosen him to be a good soldier. That he would put the battle down to one side just to take care of his own personal needs. Now, a lot of you are thinking, well, what's wrong with taking care of your personal needs, brother? You know, I got to live my life too, brother. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Check out the spirit of the second person. The second person says, I need to take care of my needs. I'm thirsty. I need a drink. <laughs> Comes down, but he says, I didn't really drink it. You guys see the spirit? The spirit says what comes first is the vision. What comes first and foremost is me making sure that everything is taken care of. I need to make sure that everything is in order. That we're safe. That everything is good. In the meantime. <laughs> so you might say, well, what's wrong with, you know, needing to rest, needing to take care of your personal thing, wanting to take a break? I've had brothers tell me I'm looking for God to tell me when I can take it easy. I'm looking for God to show me when I can take a break. Everybody wants something from me. Everybody's asking me for this. Everybody wants something from me. They're calling me, texting me, chirping me, twittering me. They're Instagramming me. They're FaceTiming me. They're doing everything to me. All I have to say is, because you that are mothers, you understand that there ain't no taking no break from your children, but yet you tired, yet you worn out, yet you pray God would give you some type of respite from heaven. But yet there's no break. What do you do? You just keep going forward. When do you sleep? When they sleep. When do you eat? When they eat. When do you take a break? <laughs> like this. I'm taking a break while I'm watching you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I fear that in the house of the Lord, there's too many men that are worried about taking it easy and kicking back and don't want no responsibility and don't want to do the work of the Lord because of this. I am fearful and afraid that we are missing an opportunity to give God glory to God's kingdom because we want to kick back. There is a work that needs to be accomplished and a vision that needs to be secured and a mindset that needs to be maintained. And all of heaven calls for a few good men 
to step up to the cause. David come out with his brothers. And everybody's looking at this big old giant, Goliath. And everybody's fearful. Everybody's afraid. And the number one thing, what comes out of David's mouth? He says, is there not a cause? Is there not something that we're working towards? Is there not something that we're trying to accomplish here that you guys would put that to one side and let fear take over? David said, that don't make no sense. God is looking for a few good men that will keep the vision. That's why the scripture says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. And the lion only roars after he has his prey. I ain't never heard that one before. Huh? <laughs> Turn to somebody next to you and tell them God's looking for a few good men. The quality that God found was in the ones that were not putting their own comfort first. When he found the ones that bring the water up and cupped it and brought it to their mouth, that means that those were the quality soldiers. Those were the ones that were good, better, best. Those were the best. He had narrowed it down out of all of those men, out of thousands, that there was only 300 that were top-notch quality. Those come with a 10-year warranty. Why? Because those ones have been tried and tested and proved. God's looking for a few good men. He's looking for a few good sisters. Especially with there being so many talk out here in this world of, of this and that. Bringing negativity to your church. Bringing negativity to how you serve God. Bringing negativity to the organization that you're a part. These people are like this and like that and like that. In the face of that, God is looking. God is searching, find, trying to find somebody that would just stick around and not leave. Just someone that would just stick around and serve God with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul, all of their strength, no matter what hardness comes. No matter what they have to endure, they stick it out and they stick it through until the end because they have no choice. The vision, the cause is at hand. That's why the scripture says where there is no vision, the people. It's the vision. It's the vision that no matter what's going on, you're still focused on the vision and still taking care of your needs. The Bible talks about when David came down to the battle, he came to take his brother's lunch. And when he gets there, Goliath is there. He tells them, is there not a cause? Is there not something that's driving us? Are we going to be are we going to be bested by these uncircumcised Philistines? You guys are all scared now all of a sudden. He says, I can't even deal with all you scaredy cats. And he didn't say it like that, but he kind of said it like that. He said, I'll do it. Everybody looked at him. He says, man, you're just a little kid. Get out of here, man. You boo-boo. <laughs> Check your diaper right now. Amen. So here's Saul, the king, and he says, listen, man, there's no way that you're going to be able to go up against Goliath, but I'll let you go because I ain't got no good men here. Everybody's scared. He said, but I'm going to let you go. He says, but you're not going to be able to make it because you're just a little boy. This man is a man of war. He says, listen, the only way you're going to make it is if you put on my armor. Remember that? He said, here, take my armor. You need it. You need it. 
And David looked at him. He put all the armor on. The armor was all big. It was all falling off of him and everything. It was like E.T. with this big old giant armor, like a small little guy in there, big old armor. And David said, no, 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 no. He says, I can't take these. I can't take your armor. The reason I can't take it is because it hasn't been tested yet. It hasn't been proved yet. This ain't good enough for me. I need something that's the best. I need something that's proven. I need something that's quality. I need this sling. And the scripture says that David says that he goes up with him with just the sling. Why? Because all of his life, David is in the backside of the desert taking care of the sheep. And he's whipping this little slingshot around. And from here, he can hit the O on the over. Saws. Saws. Every time. And he says, I don't need anything that you think I need what's tested. I need what's quality. I need what's tried. I need the best. You may think your armor is good, but I got the best. God is looking for the best. God is looking for quality. God is looking for somebody that's tried and tested. God is somebody looking for somebody that wants to stay the course. That isn't concerned about their comfort. Well, you know what? I'm just going to show up to church and I'm going to go and I'm going to hear the scripture. And I'm going to go home and I'm just going to live however. I know they want me to memorize scripture and stuff and I'm supposed to pray. But I don't really feel like doing that. I'm going to serve God my way. I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to serve God how I want to serve God. And I'm going to feel good about it. And I'm not going to let you judge me. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and tell him, come on. Come on. Jesus is there, and he's preaching to all of these people, and he's got about 5,000 people there. And all of a sudden, he's been preaching for such a long time, and the people just want to hear him speak. And he says, you know what? We're, we're going to have to send the people away, but, but we can't. We, they, now, what do we do? Do we go into town and go get, I mean, everybody's hungry. Everybody's got to eat. What are we going to do? Are we going to send the people away? I don't know. What are we going to do? Matthew, what do you think? We send the people away. I don't know. Talk to John. John knows everything. Hey, John, what are we going to do? We send the people away. You want to go into town, go get some lunch? How are we going to get lunch for 5,000 people? I don't know. I thought you got money. I don't got money. <laughs> How are we going to get lunch for 5,000, homie? <laughs> he said, you didn't bring anything? He said, no, I didn't bring nothing. Jesus said, just bring me what you got. You guys get that part? Jesus said, bring me what you got. me what you got I can do it with what you got oh Lord have mercy they find a little boy hey hey little brother come here come here little brother come on down dun, 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 dun. what you got in the bag homie <laughs> opens up the bag he says I got two fishes and I got five barley loaves he said give me that give it give it give it give it to me give it to me give it to me give it to me Take it to Jesus. He said, Jesus, this is what we got. He said, that's what you got? Jesus said, good. I can work with that. I don't need a whole lot. Just give me what you got. <laughs> Y'all still ain't getting this. He said, give me what you got. And he brought the two fish and the five loaves. And even though it wasn't enough for 5,000, he said, that's good. I can work with that. Jesus is not looking for you to have all the answers. He's not looking for you to have everything all together. He says, just give me what you got. Give me what you got. Give, bring me a little bit. Bring me a desire. Bring me a little bit. Just give me what you got. I don't need a whole lot to get things done. He had Gideon. He says, listen, with these 300, that's all I need. I just need a little bit. I just need a little bit. Give me 300 of the best 
because I'd rather have a little bit that's the best than to have a lot that is fearful. 